Dominica's proactive efforts uh, post Hurricane Maria in 2017, um, where in Dominica, um, one of the major programs being undertaken by the government is trying to build climate resilient homes on a large scale. And uh, so at COP28, um, when the Prime Minister of, of Dominica, Honorable Spirit, alluded to that prior to COP28, that he and a lot of his colleagues from the Caribbean would be focusing on the loss and damage financial mechanism. How do we improve access for the Caribbean region? Welcome to another edition of Caribbean Climate Calabash. My name is Hippolyte Novello from Dubai, and I am joined by Richie Farrell from Dominica. Richie, how are you doing today? Yeah, Hippolyte, I'm doing fine. Uh, it's uh, a little bit overcast here in Dominica, but uh, all the same, it's a good day. Okay, so you are one of our COP28 virtual fellow you are reporting on what's happening and the latest developments of cup here in in dubai um how has the experience been so far oh man it's been good um uh, uh, um a lot of cooperation you know from the editors uh who are, who are currently in dubai um i know that they're very busy uh including yourself but um they make time for all of us you know and that's been helpful um, with the process and trying to follow the logistics, even from a virtual standpoint of what is happening at COP28 in Dubai. It's intense, Hippolyta. A lot of information coming in, but I mean, we're trained for this. So we're pretty much focusing and zeroing, zeroing in on the topics that we focus on. Me, loss and damage and uh, the facing out of fossil fuels and um, with the help and support of the Climate Tracker team, it's been a good experience. You know, like many of the fellows here, um, physically and virtual fellows are focusing on the Caribbean region. You know, as we know, the Caribbean region is one of the most vulnerable regions when it comes to climate change. And loss and damage is a huge topic for the Caribbean leaders and the region here. What went through your mind when you first heard that there were millions of dollars in pledges for the loss and damage fund. Okay, so so what went through my mind is um, at least a lot of the industrial un industrialized countries are pretty much um, giving the science additional credibility um, in that they they are putting action to what the science is revealing, that there's a, there's a lot of damage happening in regions um, like the Caribbean caused by human-induced climate change. And so I'm happy that so far, I think we, I think globally pledges among to over 700 million, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but a lot of our Caribbean leaders are saying based on the science, that's not really enough. We haven't reached uh, uh, an amount that would provide, uh, you know, compensation to match the level of damage that, that, that climate change is causing in the Caribbean. Yeah, and okay, so first of all, the last damage fund, which was um, created in the COP27 in Egypt, was a fund without money. And as the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines mentioned, um, Rav Gonzalez, that's an oxymoron. How can you have a fund without money to begin with? So this year being launched at the first day of COP, and in total, I believe up to this morning, there were like $725 million in pledges. Now, as you mentioned, that they're not even nearly enough. Countries um, who are parts of AOCs, who are vulnerable countries around the world, need at least from my understanding, over $1 trillion every single year. Now we're talking about T, not billions, not millions. We are talking about trillions of dollars every single year. So that's $725 million is practically 
I don't even if it's a drop in the bucket. It's just it's just space in the bucket, I guess. But it's it like you mentioned, it's not enough in, in terms of what's happening with with loss and damage in the Caribbean and other vulnerable countries. Hopefully, the pledges increases. But then again, the Caribbean leaders here now have an issue with that because you know what they say: "Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice." Because these are pledges too as well. They brought up the $100 billion pledge when it came to, um, I think, the Paris Agreement. Paris Agreement, yeah, in 2015. We're not for, they were not fulfilled. They were not fulfilled. So now you're coming again with pledges. And basically, they're saying, we don't want to hear pledges. We want to see the money. Show we the money. Um, so we could actually have some sort of movement towards addressing loss and damage. You did mm -hmm. a story about loss and damage and how it affects Dominica. Um, tell us more about that. Um, well, the one that's published, um, I can tell you, um, it really focused on Dominica's proactive efforts uh, post Hurricane Maria in 2017, um, where in Dominica, um, one of the major programs being undertaken by the government is trying to build climate resilient homes on a large scale. And uh, so at COP28, um, when the Prime Minister of, of Dominica, Honorable Spirit, alluded to that prior to COP28, that he and a lot of his colleagues from the Caribbean would be focusing on the loss and damage financial mechanism. How do we improve access for the Caribbean region? And that, uh, from what I've seen, um, have been addressed right now. Like you rightly said, Ippolito, uh, Caribbean leaders are focusing pretty much on the, the amount of money that needs to go into the loss and damage fund um, at this point in time. So um, that story uh, showed that Dominica was being proactive even while this loss and damage fund was not yet fully operationalized. As you know, this was done just two days ago. So um, Dominica has been taking a, a stance of um, not really playing victim, but um, as well as other Caribbean countries. Uh, the Caribbean has taken that stance, but specific to Dominica, it has taken a stance where um, I'm not just blaming you, uh, even if you caused the problem, we're doing what we can, but we need we need the additional funding um, from the loss and damage fund, and that's that's the position um, the story highlights. Yeah, and and uh, PM Skerritt had mentioned that there are now two fundamental points on how to deal with now with this loss and damage fund. How do we access it, and when? And all of that is part of the negotiation going deeper into cap the requirements for the country who can access. Um, the funds, how they can access it, how long it will take for them to access that money, and will there be a starting cap, a starting um, capital, and then would there be a limit? For instance, let's say um, Pakistan. Pakistan had extreme flooding. Now the damage it caused was about forty billion dollars. So none of so so some Caribbean leaders are saying so. Okay, we can't give every, the forty billion dollars to Pakistan because that would dry up the funds. So all of that, I guess, is, is part of the negotiations. And I hope I hope that um, by early December that something is finalized and that we see true actionable decisions that could benefit um, communities in, in Dominica, indigenous communities and vulnerable groups across the region. Well, it's like you said, and, and like uh, Honorable Gonzalo said from St. Vincent, um, if we if we are doing this um, uh, this this loss and damage fund, it has to be done right. And so I believe uh, Honorable Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt um, is on the point that with his statements as regards um, again um, trying to address access and timing. Because I was speaking with a scientist a few months ago. Um, He's at, he's at, um, I believe he's based in 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 UE, the Barbados Barbados um, site, and he was telling me uh, 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 when this when this talk comes up, one of the key things that 
um, leaders must also focus on in terms of the loss and damage fund is timing. Is timing, and, and now we're seeing that Honorable Scarlett is actually talking about this at, at the negotiation level. Um, so he's definitely right on the ball because I may give you assistance um, through this fund, but if it's not received in time to deal or, or, or to provide compensation to whatever uh, uh, adaptation project, mitigation project that it has to go to, if that doesn't, if that fund doesn't come in time, then by the time the fund arrives, by the time I use it, another problem has probably, you know, come on top of that. So it's very interesting um, if this doesn't get resolved. Uh, at the end of COP28, this would spell a loss for, for the Caribbean region. Yeah, and I agree, and I totally agree with you, and I totally agree with the Honorable PM Skerritt, that these protocols and the process in accessing the funds and when a country could access the fund and what could trigger the country to access, access this fund have to be practical. You can't, you can't have an, a, a, a hurricane, God forbid, this weekend, and then it takes five, 10 years for the country to access loss and damage, it makes absolutely exactly. no sense. It, exactly. defeats the, it defeats the purpose. And not it's only purpose, that, yeah. it defeats the purpose. And then and then the thing is that with the effects of climate change, as you mentioned, another thing might happen. Another extreme weather event might happen. So that would only compile the problems that vulnerable groups are going uh, are dealing with. And and it's, it's, I hope I hope that um, the big polluter countries realize this. And, and, and the thing is that I see from people around here is that some negotiators and the big polluter countries, they don't really care that much. Or it's, it's, it's all about the politics. It's all about the show. Um, the PM of, of Bahamas, um, Mr. Davis, had mentioned to me it was that, you know, basically it would be that um, these persons would go up there, give speech, give say pledges, and then they would think that, okay, we'll we'll quiet down, we'll we'll make no more noise. But the Caribbean leaders, I think, are determined to make sure that the money is rolling, so that yeah, they, they, have people, they have to be. They have, yeah, exactly. it's a matter have, of survival. Yeah, and the thing is that climate change affects not only lives, it affects livelihoods. It affects every single thing. So hopefully this time around, COP28 makes a significant positive difference in our lives. And I say in our lives because we are all affected by climate change because we live in the Caribbean region. Yeah, and I, I agree with you 110%, Ibolito. And um, what, one of the other things, uh, one of the stories that I, I sent in, uh, I believe it's in the final stages of editing, so I can talk about it. Um, it it's in reference to uh, not entirely a new concept, but a new mechanism for the Caribbean region. It is something that I believe CARICOM needs to consider come 2024. And the, the story really gives, gives the, the, the reader or the listener uh, a very clear understanding of that concept. And the concept is the creation of a regional carbon credit fund, insurance fund. And this would be unique to the Caribbean region where states or Caribbean countries that participate in the carbon market, a percentage of their profits would be put aside into a special fund that would be run by a, an established regional insurance agency. And then you would get oversight from an established financial institution like the ECCB or the CDB. Using those existing tools within a matter of months, uh, the Caribbean could actually create that type of revolving fund, which would provide, I would say, quick climate financing, you know, a, a, another form of climate financing that we could use to continue helping ourselves because we really have to be innovative um, when dealing with this dynamic concept of, you know, climate change. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, Belize's Minister of State in the Ministry of 
finance had mentioned to me is that you have these IFIs that want to give you loan, but small conscious like believes that we don't want a loan, you know, at, at high interest rate. So what they are doing is they are blending, they are blending these financial proposals, loan, grant proposal, and I forgot what he mentioned, but these loans are concessionary loans. Um, so this is what they are trying to work out because the GFC has its grant process and a loan process that they do, um, the Green Climate Fund. But countries like Belize and other countries in the Caribbean are, are saying, you know what, we don't want these loans at high interest rates. We want concessionary rates. In fact, make part of this loan a grant, a grant, because at the end I of the agree. day, we need it. We need it. And, and it's like I keep mentioning to everyone. What's happened? The Caribbean emits less than one percent of the of the global emissions. I mean, and then we are facing the, the brunt of it. We face the like, brunt, yeah. If yeah. if that's if that's not fair, then I don't know what's not fair anymore in life. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Um, so I mean, fingers crossed uh, for COP twenty eight. Um, so far, uh, we, we have some good outcomes. And, uh, and they still need to be worked on. It still needs to be ironed out, so to speak. And then you have some outstanding matters uh, that definitely needs to be addressed, like um, some form of debt relief uh, being considered for um, for the uh, least developed countries (LDCs) um, that has to be considered, uh, to my mind, um, when it comes to this whole climate financing concept. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, most definitely, and these are the stories that we will be publishing as Cup Twenty Eight rolls on, and to check out Rich's story and all the fellows' story, virtual and those here on the grounds at Cup Twenty Eight in Dubai, you can go to climatetracker.org. That's climatetracker.org for the latest what's happening here at Cup Twenty Eight. Goodbye. This has been another edition of Caribbean Climate Calabash. Thank you for joining. Yes, and I would just say goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Hippolito, uh, for the opportunity, and Mr. Taylor as well in the background, making sure things are uh, uh, A-OK. Uh, to all the, the listeners and followers of Climate Tracker, um, keep following, keep listening. Uh, we're going to do our best. Uh, bringing you all the latest of what's happening at COP28 and on climate change in our region. Thanks again.